Dude, we are going to energize the country. We need to wake up and smell the coffee. The independence case is a powerful one. Another future is possible, but we've got to fight for it. Order! Hello and welcome to the Debated Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Will. And in this episode, I'm delighted to be joined by David Hendy, an academic historian and writer, to discuss his new book, The BBC, A People's History. Welcome to the podcast, David. Thank you very much. Um, so the first question uh, that I'd like uh, to ask you, and it's perhaps a bit of a, um, a, an obvious question, is um, what made you decide to, to write this book on the history of the BBC in the first place? Well, I, I, there are already histories of the BBC. Asa Briggs has written a monumental five-volume history that stretches to, if you add it up, over 4,000 pages. Uh, and his successor, Gene Seaton, has written a sixth volume. So there is there are histories of the BBC out there, but for a start, to kind of to invest in that kind of detail and so on costs a few hundred pounds if you wanted to get the whole Asa Briggs set, uh, and it's quite a long read. Um, well, eight years ago, I knew enough about the BBC to spot that the centenary was coming, and I thought it would be an opportunity to attempt a single volume history of the BBC um, that, that might be, in a sense, more accessible uh, and more affordable. <laughs> and there was also something else which was a crucial factor at that point, which was I was approached by the BBC and given the opportunity to take a detailed look at one of the crown jewels of the BBC's archives, and that's its collection of oral history interviews. Now, the BBC has vast written archives, which are wonderful, and they're accessible to most researchers and historians and so on. The oral history interviews, which it's done over the years, it started in the early 70s, and it's been interviewing on film, in audio, about 600 or so of its former members of staff. And these have been, to put it simply, uh, kept under lock and key in the BBC's vaults and haven't been so accessible to uh, not just the public, but to academic researchers either. I, I was being given an opportunity to look at these. Now, Asa Briggs and Gene Seaton have also looked at these, but what I wanted to do was to try and explore the totality of this collection and to use it to offer, a, if you like, a more kaleidoscopic and atmospheric approach to, to the BBC. In other words, as a former program maker myself, having worked as a journalist at the BBC, I was really interested in trying to immerse myself in the program maker's perspective to kind of get a sense of, of how the BBC evolves through those daily decisions in the studios, in the production offices, to try and convey some of the sounds and the smells and the atmospheres and so on. And, and these interviews can sometimes be astonishingly frank let me I'm, I'm going to give you one example actually just just an example of something that uh, that shows the kind of thing that you can get here is here is a quote from the oral history interview with Hugh Carlton Green um, who uh, as many of you will know is a director general of the BBC in the 1960s he's just been appointed direct he's describing just being appointed director general and he's having to get rid of someone called Tahu Hole, who has been in charge of news for many years and is basically an ultra-cautious conservative figure who has really held back the development of BBC News. Here is Hugh Carlton Green, who, we should remember, had been a Daily Telegraph correspondent uh, in 1930s Germany. Uh, he'd met many of the Nazi leaders uh, and he'd been involved at the beginning of the war, interrogating Luftwaffe pilots who'd been downed. He'd run the German service for the BBC during the war. So that was his track record. Here he is on Tahu Hole. To speak quite frankly, I have had to do with the Nazi leaders in Germany, and I have never had such a sense of evil from any of them as I had from Tahu Hull. Um, now, so, so they are quite frank. They also, these oral history interviews, um, very often overlap. What you get sometimes is a cluster of accounts of a single event or a single episode. So, for instance, you get multiple accounts of D-Day 
D-Day itself during the Second World War. And you see it not just from the perspective of, say, the war correspondent at the front, but the person right at the top of the BBC's machinery who's coordinating uh, with the armed services and the intelligence services on planning D-Day. You see it from the perspective of the woman who runs the duplicating section who has to print off the scripts that announce D-Day. Uh, you see it from someone who's in a billet who comes across the war correspondence being moved into place ready for the crossing of the channel and so on. And it allows you to create this kind of kaleidoscopic approach. The same thing, for instance, with the origins of BBC Online or iPlayer. You have multiple accounts that allow you to build a, almost a second by second picture of what's going on. So, so those oral history interviews, for me, what they gave was the opportunity to try and write a slightly different version of the BBC story. And I think here, the subtitle, A People's History, is, is relevant. And I should explain that, you know, to some extent, that's because it's told from the people who made the BBC and made the programmes. But there's also something else going on there, which I think is a bit more political, which is that we, there is this rhetoric, which is quite widely shared at the moment about the BBC being a kind of faceless monolith, programs are made to order, they're machine tooled, there's a sense of groupthink, perhaps the BBC is infected by a kind of liberal metropolitan thinking and, and so on. And I really felt, you know, as a historian who's immersed in the BBC story for, for nearly 30 years, I've been studying the BBC, that that is so misleading, that actually the BBC is not a faceless monolith. If you get inside it, what you see is a kind of collection of very, very different cultures, competing cultures. Behind every programme, there is a world of debate and argument and so on. Uh, and I, I wanted to kind of get to that hidden labour, if you like, of, 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 of the people who made the BBC. Yeah. And I think you do it um, so well in the book. And one of the things that I find um, particularly compelling, which I hadn't um, realised as much until I started reading the book, was how much um, the First World War and the impact of the First World War and its aftermath influenced the creation of the BBC and influenced those who were responsible for um, directing the corporation in its very um, earliest days. Could, could you just explain to um, our listeners, uh, that those who haven't uh, read the book, how exactly did the, the First World War influence the approach of those who were um, running the BBC when it first started in 1922? Yeah, I... I, I didn't want to start the book in the traditional way, which is to tell the story of the invention of wireless and to make it a technological story. I mean, wireless had been around for 25 years already by the time the BBC starts. It seemed to me, by going back to the original sources and, and just immersing myself in, in the accounts, the very personal accounts of those who started the BBC in 1922, I was very struck by how much they were talking about their wartime experiences. It's only four years after the end of the, of the conflict. And in the aftermath of the war, you've got a lot of despair at civilization. It's as if civilization and progress had collapsed and, and, and humanity had been sliding into barbarism. And a lot of people are despairing about, you know, the decline of civilization, a permanent decline of civilization. While some people are actually looking to build a new and better world out of the wreckage of war, if you like, they're concerned about how can we maintain peace? How can we increase mutual understanding? between countries and between people with different opinions. Uh, and the answer to that appears to be better information, some commitment to culture and, 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 and so on, that would allow humanity to, to grasp its potential to change for the better. Now, I, I look at this through three men in particular, who I think arguably are the, the creative nucleus of the early BBC in 1922. One of them is Cecil Lewis, he's just 24. He was a pilot during the war, teenage pilot, and he, he's exhilarated by the experience of flying and what he calls a kind of sense of purpose, a sense of mission. 
but he's also looking down from the sky at the trenches below and despairing, despairing at the waste of conflict. And after the war, he's thinking, how do we challenge isolationism? How do we challenge this kind of mutual antagonism? For him, it was it was going to be art or music or poetry, and that would somehow create a, a spirit of international cooperation. But he's not quite sure how to put that into effect. Second person, John Reith, who many of us have heard of, and we know the first general manager of the BBC. He's a little bit older, 33 a deeply Christian upbringing in a Glasgow household, his father a minister of the church, his mother also deeply involved in doing good works, charitable works for the local poor and so on. And Reith is brought up in this kind of tradition of, of, of sort of late Victorian Christian paternalism, that one must do good in the world. He's also deeply influenced by this Victorian thinking of Matthew Arnold, Matthew Arnold, who, who wrote the famous publication Culture and Anarchy in 1869. And in that book, which was still very influential, he argued that, well, what was going to hold society together? It was going to be culture. And I mean, he refers to sweetness and light. And he says it's not just sweetness and light for some people, because that won't work. What you need is sweetness and light for everyone. Sweetness and light must prevail. And so it's a kind of it, this spreading of sweetness and light, culture, if you like, is important. And then the third person is Arthur Burroughs, who actually knows about wireless. He knows about radio. He's been, he spent the war eavesdropping on enemy wireless propaganda. And he's very struck by the idea that if you, uh, uh, if you can spread disinformation through wireless, through the air, then why not spread good information? And he, he wrote very passionately about the need to fill the ether with what he called truth ions in order to spread a, a, a doctrine of common sense, as he put it. And so pull these three people together. Cecil Lewis, who, who is interested in art and poetry and music as a, as a means to increase mutual understanding. Reith, who's got a sense of wanting to do good in the world. Arthur Burroughs, who thinks that wireless is going to be the tool to do this. And it coalesces into the core ethos of the early BBC, which is, to quote that idea of Reith, which comes straight from Matthew Arnold, the best that has been thought and said right, to spread the best that has been thought and said. And this is the crucial thing. It's not just the best that has been thought and said, but to as many homes as possible. It was no good ring-fencing culture for the privileged few. You could only improve society, you could only embed civilization if you made it available to everyone on an equal basis. And it wasn't just about uplift and serious stuff, it was about rest and relaxation as well. To be a as Reith would put it, a true citizen and, and to lead a full life, you needed rest and pleasure as much as uplift and information. And this, I mean, just to jump forward, is why, in a sense, the debate about whether the BBC should move to subscription is really important. Because whatever you think about the licence fee, subscription is a completely undermines the core ethos of the BBC that was there right from the beginning, which is access to the best for everyone equally. Yes, absolutely. And one, one of the things that I, I thought was particularly interesting about um, reading the book, particularly the um, early um, BBC Talks uh, programmes, is the sheer variety of content that was being produced from um, the discussion between Harold Nicholson and his wife, Vita Sackville West on marriage, um, to, you know, geography programmes and, and, and all these kind of things. And I, I just wondered, how important do you think it is, particularly uh, looking back on those early origins of the BBC, that there was this creative freedom and this variety of content that has been produced throughout its history, that it's not an organisation that has merely focused on um, one particular area, whether it be a particular type of drama or a particular type of documentary programme or whatever. It has always been a great um, variety producer. I mean, do, do you think that that's sort of part of the reason that the BBC has been embraced by 
the British people so much throughout its history, the sheer variety of content that is produced and is accessible to, to, to so many people. Yes, I, I think absolutely. That, that variety is not accidental. It is core to that, that Rethian idea that, that, that what, makes, what makes us lead the full life, it is, it is the rich mix of of news and entertainment and education right those yeah. those key things one just one or the other would not lead to the full life a balanced life as it were so so it's there by design I and mean, we have to say that right at the beginning in the 1920s there was still a sense of well how do we fill the schedule okay that's the idea maybe but as reith said there were no sealed orders to open when they started the BBC. And you had the schedule, you had several hours of programming to find with very few resources. And to some extent it therefore was a very ad hoc existence. You know, we'd, we'd have some some music recitals here and some, some readings from plays there, um, uh, short extracts from uh, plays, children's hour and so on. But it was all kind of fairly, fairly ad hoc. And the accounts you get of the BBC in its Savoy Hill days in the 1920s is is surprising about the creative freedom because Reith is there He's clearly got a presence. He's sort of physically tall and intimidating. People describe him as looking like a, a villain, out, villain out of a melodrama. Um, and he's got very clear opinions about what he likes and what he doesn't like. On the other hand, people say, people who work there say he was too busy dealing with the high politics, if you like, to worry about some of the details of programming. And they say we were left, by and large, to get on with it ourselves. Um, so I think that's that's really important. Now that creative freedom clearly ebbs and flows. We we might, if we don't know much about how the BBC works, think of it as very rule bound, very rigid. Actually, there are very very few strict rules for program makers. The assumption right from the beginning was that basically, if you employ the right sort of chap. To, to join the BBC, he, and it was usually a he, it was sometimes a she and increasingly a she, but at the early days, it was mostly he. Employ the right sort of chap uh, and they can be trusted by and large to make the right sort of decisions. Now, clearly there are problems with that, you know, if, if, if recruitment comes from too narrow a social circle and so on. But it does mean that that in a sense, the control, the restraints on creativity are, are more subtle. It's really a, a case of who's at the top and what the political atmosphere is. The BBC always has antennae for political atmosphere. And in the 1930s, it was very clear that Reith was more and more nervous about criticism, particularly from the Conservative Party, um, about the BBC harboring left-wing views and so on. And, and, and so there was an increasing sense that creative freedom was being monitored and restricted in the, in the middle of the 1930s, but not everywhere and not equally. The BBC was already too big a machine to control completely. So in North Region, for instance, in Manchester, you had a really lively uh, scene in the BBC of people making documentaries about the lives and the appalling working conditions of ordinary people. Geoffrey Brightson, who's doing vivid portraits of um, steel workers and miners. Olive Shapley, uh, who's, who's interviewing people in the street about the cost of living and so on. Um, so, so the BBC is already too vast and complicated for us to be able to kind of describe it in one simple way. Now, if we jump forward to say the 1950s and that's a moment where the BBC is under scrutiny because we've got the we've got commercial television about to arrive in in 1955. I think there's a really interesting bits of evidence from the oral history here and I want to I want to just quote an, another couple of bits from that oral history because I think it's really really telling and this is from from two monumentally important figures who worked in BBC television in the 1950s. Hugh Weldon, 
who was a, 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 a leading editor of arts programs, and David Attenborough, who before he became known to us all as a presenter of epic wildlife programs, worked behind the scenes as a BBC producer. And, and, and they, they talk really interestingly about creativity at the BBC. And David Attenborough says this, he says, our discussions over coffee in the canteen were vigorous and never ending. What visually was the best way to change shots? When could we justifiably use music? Was it dishonest to mix film sequences shot earlier with live action without making it explicit that we were doing so? In other words, they were constantly questioning themselves and exploring the creative potential of the medium. Ian Weldon says, says this, the people who worked at the BBC had enough experience of quarrels to be able to quarrel very fruitfully for long periods of time without buggering everything up. And he also says, and this is really important, he says, nobody ever said to me, you can't do this. Nobody, not ever. He says that that attitude came from deep within the corporation. He said, uh, the BBC was an institution that had been brought up over the years to understand something about the nature of freedom and the nature of freedom to make things. They bore it and they backed it from all up on high, he said, but it came from low down. And I think that's a really, really telling account from the oral history. Um, he's got no reason to uh, be disingenuous here. This is a kind of retrospective reflection on his life and career. And here is someone saying that there is a kind of fundamental uh, intuitive commitment to, to creative freedom. Now, of course, you can speak to many programme makers and you know that there are all sorts of restraints and complications and there will be people who say, I was stopped from doing what I want to do. And one of the factors that we always have to bear in mind is because the BBC is alert to political atmosphere, it does become very, very nervous, particularly about the reaction of the right wing press. Uh, and that can induce a, a, what, what has been called a precautionary vigilance. So I don't want to over romanticise this, but it does, it is there as part of the BBC's DNA. Mm. Yes, and, and, and I think on that point of um, the BBC's caution, perhaps to, to certain um, uh, political organisations, it, it, it's fascinating to look through the book at the BBC's um, approach to politicians from the um, Second World War onwards, uh, going into the sort of the, the, the 1970s and 80s and later on when um, political interviews perhaps became a, a, a bit, bit more uh, grilling in their nature and, and how that had changed from the 40s and 50s when there was perhaps a bit more of a, a deferential um, air to politicians, politicians of all stripes. Do you think that the BBC's approach to politicians and the way that it has dealt with them both in terms of interviewing them or in um, portraying them has changed at all from, from one of, of, of being perhaps cautious of not wanting to inflame them to um, one in which at times with particular interviews, it has been a bit more confrontational because it and its um, presenters and producers believe that there has to be a certain amount of, of confrontation between a, an independent broadcaster and a, an elected politician. I mean, I think if we if we kind of try and summarise the, the general narrative arc mm -hmm. in the BBC's history, then yes, that's absolutely, absolutely clear that the BBC, the style of interviewing, and it's not just on the BBC, of course, it's, you know, the BBC is part of a wider media ecology here, that that style of interviewing politicians has become more probing, sometimes confrontational, but sometimes we mix up confrontational with probing. And some politicians will say they don't mind hard questions. Harold Wilson, who was famously thin-skinned, did actually say in his oral history interview for the BBC um, that, that he really didn't mind. He felt that the harder the questions, the better he responded. So, so it's not a straightforward uh, binary distinction between deferential and confrontational, I think. There are all sorts of kind of subtle variations in between. But, I mean, but clearly it's changed. If you go back to the war, there's a, there's a great phrase from Alan Bullock, the historian, who is working at the BBC in the European services during the wartime. 
And he's having to deal with a situation where there is very tight government control in the conditions of war. And in the European service, of course, a lot of direction from the foreign office and from the intelligence services and so on, uh, the political warfare executive. Alan Bullock describes the relationship as pull and push. In other words, it's a kind of close embrace, but it's not without friction. Um, and I think that's probably the way to describe it. It, it. Even in wartime, the government knew that if the BBC was the main means of, of disseminating messages, then it was important that the listening public, whether it was the British or the European listening public, had to trust the BBC. It would only trust the BBC if the BBC was by and large uh, disseminating uh, truth and was accurate. And therefore, there was a limit to the extent to which politicians could interfere with the BBC before they kind of damaged their main means of uh, getting information across to the public. Um, the other thing that's happening, of course, is that the, the people who work for the BBC at sort of senior levels in news and current affairs are quite intimate socially and <laughs> And, and sort of they align themselves in many ways with West, the worlds of Westminster and Whitehall. Take someone like Grace Wyndham Goldie, who was a leading figure running talks and current affairs in television in the 1950s. Now, during the war, she'd worked for Whitehall uh, as a civil servant involved in the distribution of food and so on. And she, she describes very, very movingly in her oral history the way in which she just felt respect for the world of Westminster and Whitehall, that you know, that the politicians and civil servants served the public. And there was this idea that actually the BBC and the world of Westminster and Whitehall were engaged in a joint mission, which was to explain policy to civil society. And, and that's what the BBC's role was. I think the danger with that, of course, is that then the BBC's sense of what defines journalism is focused on the worlds of Westminster and Whitehall, perhaps at the expense of a broader view of what's happening in society. Um, so that's, that's slightly problematic, that kind of intimacy, that, that sense of joint mission um, can slide rather too easily into something kind of deferential and, and chummy. And even before the 60s, we have a kind of flashpoint that's around about Suez in 1956, which becomes a sharp reminder of what's at stake with this relationship. When Anthony Eden uh, takes to the airwaves and, and, and um, talks about Suez uh, to the nation, and the BBC is aware of the fact that public opinion and indeed parliamentary opinion is divided on the issue of military intervention in the Middle East. And therefore it's appropriate for the leader of the opposition, Hugh Gateskill, to be given a right of reply. The government believes that wartime conditions apply and therefore there shouldn't be a right of reply. And so there's a kind of huge row that erupts over this. And what's really at stake is who controls the agenda in one sense? Is it the party machines or is it the kind of editorial judgment of, of the BBC? So we're already starting to sense that we're in a changing world here, a changing relationship. And then in 1960, you have a new director general, Hugh Carlton Green, who famously says, you know, the BBC should open the windows and, 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 and it should be, um, have the fresh air of new ideas. It should be willing to upset people, but if it only did things that uh, everyone was pleased or delighted with, the BBC was failing and so on. And it's in the wake of that kind of signal from the top that you get Robin Day um, employed to, to interrogate uh, politicians. You get William Hardcastle uh, taking the chair at the World at One on radio. Uh, the Today programme isn't by any means yet a serious political uh, programme. Uh, it's a bit of a kind of, as it was described, a morning mis miscellany. Um, but it's in things like World at One and Election Call and so on that you're starting to see politicians being probed. And I think that, you know, that although there are lots of accusations about this being 
combative uh, and so on. Actually, what you've really got is, by and large, most of the time, still very polite, but probing, but insistent interviews with politicians. I think now, if we jump forward to the present, we've got a new and problematic situation. Mm. Peter Oborn has, has written very vividly about a situation where up until relatively recently, most journalists would assume that most politicians they're interviewing uh, can be trusted at face value. And Peter Oborn is making the point that actually, and he, I mean, he, you know, his particular criticism is aimed at Trump, it's aimed at Boris Johnson, it's wrapped up with Brexit, it's wrapped up with the 2019 election and some of the claims that were made by the Tory party then. The, the, the BBC now confronts a situation where politicians, it would appear, are willing to tell untruths mm. in interviews. How do you deal with that? And I think that's going to be a real challenge for the BBC in, mm. in the next few years. Yes, absolutely. And it's interesting there that you mentioned um, uh, uh, Trump there, because, of course, famously, when John Sopel was uh, trying to interview him, I think this was when he was first elected president, and he said that he was from the, the BBC. Trump re responded, oh, BBC, you're worse than... Uh, you're worse than CNN in, in, in terms of how they, they, they represent him. And I think it's fascinating um, in the book and, and, and when you're looking at the history of the BBC overall to see how the BBC has shaped the world's view of Britain, how intertwined the standards of the BBC and, and, and the content of the BBC that is produced has, has, has become enmeshed with the, the national image of, of Britain, whether that be through uh, programmes that are being produced, whether that be through uh, the World Service or whether that be through um, BBC monitoring, um, which, of course, is a very important um, journalistic tool. I mean, why do you think that the, the BBC has become so associated with, with Britain's, uh, with, with the world's view of Britain, do you think it is solely the um, the quality of the of the content produced, and the people in Britain want to be associated with that, and therefore people around the world associate them with that? Or, or, or what what do you think it is that has has, has caused that uh, that shaping? I mean, I do think the, the the Second World War was a crucial moment here. Mm -hmm. I mean, BBC did have an empire service from 1932, but essentially that was a service really for the kind of expat white. Brits abroad and the colonial class in the colonies and the dominions. There was no attempt to kind of, as it were, speak to or embrace indigenous communities around the world. It was a kind of slice of home. But, but the Second World War is different. By the end of the Second World War, you've got something like 20 million listeners across continental Europe who've been listening to the BBC and have learned to trust the BBC. And, and, and so it means that in the post-war era, there is an incredible um, treasure chest of, of trust in the BBC for, for what it's done during the war. It's also um, developed intimate relationships with other broadcasters like the ABC in Australia, uh, the CBC in Canada, and so on, because of the exchange of staff during the war. Canadians, Australians, New Zealanders, uh, South Africans, Americans are all coming to London uh, and being seconded to the BBC. And people from the BBC afterwards are then being seconded to these other broadcasters and sort of, as it were, trying to seed BBC values around the world. So it's not just what's happening on air in terms of the broadcasts of the overseas service or what becomes the world service, uh, this projection of Britain. It's also what's happening behind the scenes, this sort of traffic in kind of staff where people are coming to kind of experience, well, how do the BBC do things and so on. Um, so so this, this is an extraordinary uh, bit of cultural capital not just for the BBC, but for Britain in the post-war era. And it's it's in danger of being squandered. I mean, one of the things that Winston Churchill wants to do um, before he loses the, the 1945 election is to cut back considerably on the BBC's external broadcasts. And then you have austerity and, and so on. And actually, there's a constant idea from politicians that you can turn the tap on and off and, and 
and cut back these these services. Whereas the BBC understands that what you really need is to be constantly there, slowly building up audience loyalty and so on. Um, now it's complicated. It's complicated because there are tangled up relationships. The external services of the BBC are funded directly by the Foreign Office for most of the post-war period. Um, there's the Cold War and tension there between generally a foreign office who would like a kind of more vigorous anti-Soviet uh, kind of broadcasting and people in the BBC who believe that actually that would be counterproductive and actually what you really want is to kind of, as, as, as Hugh Carlton Green put it, just try and gently extol the virtues of Western life so that they kind of perhaps despise us a little bit less. You've also got the process of empire transitioning into commonwealth this sort of idea of a voluntary kind of network of of mutual understanding and and, and friendship that could be nurtured through sharing coverage of sport and, and ceremonial events like the coronation and so on but also a feeling that maybe this is just a new and subtle form of colonialism that, that it still means London and BBC values are at the center of it and, and and actually if you kind of take away at some of the the views of people who work for say the Canadian Broadcasting Company or the Australian Broadcasting Corporation they they um, they're a little bit critical. They 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 they're fed up with the BBC kind of assuming that it's always the best. And yet, and yet, you know, despite all the cutbacks, despite everything, the scale and reach of the BBC's international broadcasts is really really important and it's really impressive. And someone like George Ivan Smith, who had worked for the ABC in Australia, and who came to the BBC to run the Pacific Service in the wartime, he said that you know in the post-war period the BBC was leaving its calling card all over the world. And that was really the kind of the, the achievement in terms of projecting Britain, if you like. It was a kind of slow, cumulative, subtle form of soft power. And as, as, as one historian has, has pointed out, all of this was being achieved for one third of 1% of the British defence budget. Absolutely. And I think that the, the value of the BBC, something obviously that has, has come up in, um, in the podcast so far, and of course, as, as, as you mentioned earlier, is one that is constantly being questioned in terms of the the licence fee, and, and so in its 100th anniversary year, what do you think the BBC's future is in the age of streaming services and of online content creation? Because you have many people, uh, particularly those from the, the, the right and the Conservative Party, who seem to have this assumption that the BBC can be uh, uh, equated with, with things like Netflix or, or Amazon Prime, failing to, to weigh up the, the vast... Uh, services that the BBC provide that Netflix or Amazon Prime uh, don't. I mean, how do you think the BBC can survive in an atmosphere where there is a certain ignorance about the comparative um, quality of the BBC as, as, as compared to some other um, streaming services and, and online content creation platforms, particularly within the government? I mean, I mean, you see comments from from different government ministers that are <laughs> that are quite. <laughs> explicitly um, ignorant of, 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 of the comparisons between the service provided by the BBC and, and that provided by, by other services. Well, I, I'm a bit suspicious. I'm not sure if it's ignorance. I think it's it's sort of willed ignorance. Mm. <laughs> um, and, I, and I think it's kind of, it feeds into the idea that I think they want to propagate that the BBC is in a sense, essentially a 20th century thing and we've moved on. Uh, that it's about radio and television and, and new media and online services and streaming. They are the future and it's nothing to do with the BBC. Well, I mean, the first thing I say to that is, of course, the BBC was deeply involved in creating this world of, of streaming and online, right? I mean, one of the things I, I've tried to do in the book by drawing on this new oral history material is to, for instance, tell the story of the creation of BBC Online in the 1990s, at a time when a lot of commercial companies were unable and unwilling to invest in the long-term experimentation and work of developing online services. 
you can trace it back to the BBC's development of the BBC Micro and so on. Jump forward to iPlayer uh, and the role of the BBC in developing video on demand. Even the chief executive of Netflix said that he owed a great deal to BBC iPlayer, which showed the way. Now, OK, so that was then and this is now. But even now, it's true, Netflix, YouTube, Apple, and so on, have vastly more resources. Lots of young people in particular are spending more time on those platforms than on the BBC. But the BBC is also there too. Very often what people are watching on Netflix happens to be, for instance, a BBC produced program. Uh, similarly with YouTube, Radio One, has a YouTube channel with over 7 million subscribers. That makes it the largest radio station on YouTube in the world. So, so the BBC is there. It's not about, I mean, the BBC has always said it's not about radio or television. It's about public service. How do you contribute to the nation by making the best available to as many people as possible? It's by being in as many places as possible. So there is nothing intuitively intrinsically that is stopping the BBC from being able to work as part of this new media environment. It's got a vast program archive that it can make available. It's got vast institutional knowledge built up over a hundred years. Um, it's got no commercial need to have instant returns. So it can invest in long-term experimentation. It can try out formats and talents and so on without necessarily getting an immediate response. It just needs the political will to support it and to, and to fund it to be able to take on these international corporations. And the political will, I'm afraid, is precisely what is lacking at the moment. The, 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 the core political argument is about distinctiveness mm. or value for money and so on. Well, distinctiveness is, is code for we want a smaller BBC. Yeah. We want the BBC to just, I don't know, do a bit of opera uh, or, or some uh, news and it can be available on subscription. Well, as I said, subscription is, is the worst possible outcome. It might well be that the licence fee needs to be replaced in the future. But if it's replaced, I think the, uh, the, the real concern is that it needs to be replaced by something that allows the BBC to still be a universal service in some way not restricted to subscribers. And, and what is it that's distinctive about the BBC? It's precisely the range and variety of its programmes. It's not individual programmes that are either distinctive or not distinctive. It's the totality that is the public service of the BBC. I mean, these are all political arguments and in the end, it's going to be a political decision. It's going to, the future of the BBC, I'm afraid to say, is going to depend very crucially on how people vote at the next election. Absolutely. Well, uh, we're coming towards the end of the podcast, David, and I have one final question for you. Now, we have discussed um, that variety of programming, that totality of um, programming that you just mentioned there. But if I had to pin you down and ask for one specific programme or one series of specific programmes that you believed summed up uh, the, the output of the BBC across its 100 years, what programme or what series of programmes would you pick that you think uh, best represents the BBC? Oh, that, I mean, you've saved the, the hardest question until, <laughs> until last. Thank you very much. What Talk about putting me on the spot. I mean, you know, I mean, I say in the book, there have been between, and we can't count, 10 million and 20 million programs. I've yeah. got to use just one. Well, um, I, mean, I mean, having just said that what is distinctive about the BBC is the sheer variety, <laughs> it's very hard for me to pick a program. But I suppose I would therefore have to pick a program that has as part of its own DNA, a sense of variety. And I suppose, let me just, let me just go for something like Blue Peter, a children's program that I know for some people might seem a little bit cloying and middle class and so on. But what an extraordinary program since it started at the end of the 1950s. Um, it's got a sense of a variety 
within it, right? It's always had that variety. It's got adventure, it's got filmed reports, it's got travel, it's got natural history. It's got creativity um, it, you know, in terms of making things. It's, got, it's, it's had readings and dramas and so on. It's personable and it, it takes seriously the idea that children are not just consumers in the making, but citizens in the making. And it takes seriously the idea that not everyone in the audience has equal access to resources. So that when, for instance, it does its ch great charity fundraisers, it has chosen ways in which everyone can contribute by sending in stamps or milk bottle tops or whatever. It's not just about uh, uh, writing a check. That it's, its tradition of having Blue Peter pets is designed very much for those at home who don't have pets of their own. It's got an extraordinarily intimate relationship with its audience. It, you know, the letters that pour in, the way in which it responds to the letters, the Blue Peter badges and so on, creates a sense of community. It's got a kind of collective spirit. So I suppose, even though it's many, many years since I've watched Blue Peter myself, um, I would choose that as something which in many ways embodies all of the things that the BBC writ large tries to do. Well, I think that that's a, a, a fantastic choice and one that I'm sure many of our listeners uh, will agree on. Such a, a, a wonderful programme and one, as, as you say, that has appealed to millions of children for, for decades. Thank you once again for coming on the podcast, uh, David. If people would like to, to buy the book, which I sincerely recommend that they do, where should they go? to uh, purchase a copy of the book? Um, well, I, I don't want to favour one retailer <laughs> over another, so I would just say um, try out your, your local independent bookstore if you can. <laughs> uh, and uh, failing that, um, you know, order it at a, a chain bookstore and failing that, I suppose you could go online. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, of course I would encourage people to, to buy it. Excellent. Well, thank you once again for coming on the podcast. Thank you for listening to this episode of the podcast. If you've enjoyed it, you can subscribe to us on iTunes, Spotify, Podbeam and Amazon Music. You can also follow us on Twitter, at Debated Podcast, like us on Facebook, Debated Podcast, and if you'd like to get in touch with us, whether about appearing on an episode of the podcast or commenting on an episode that you've listened to, you can do so at the Debated Podcast at gmail.com. Thank you for listening. I hope you listen to the next one.